Hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another jam-packed, action-filled information overload coming your way just for you. We're going to start off today, before we get into our Prayer University segment, uh, we're going to take a look at the legacy of a longtime Twin Cities journalist uh, who had passed away a week ago. We're going to go right to the clip here with, uh, this is a Carol Evan piece. Well, tonight, the community from journalists to the governor is responding to the passing of longtime local reporter and columnist Nick Coleman. He's a wonderful guy. Uh, I played hockey with him back in both of our younger days, and you know, I, I laughed at every column he wrote except the ones about me. And then I had to, but that's his job, you know. And he is just a hot, great spirited and great uh, public uh, citizen, and it's very, very much uh, regret his passing. According to the Pioneer Press, Coleman died earlier today, three days after suffering a massive stroke. For more than 40 years, Nick Coleman worked as a journalist both at the Pioneer Press and Star Tribune. As Carol Evans' Carla Holt reports, Coleman leaves a legacy of watchdog journalism. An icon of the most gritty form of journalism, today himself the headline. Nick Coleman capitalized on his role as columnist and reporter to crack down on community wrongs, whether racism or what Mother Nature delivered in the form of floods. Nick was a son of state political royalty, his father a former Senate majority leader, his brother the former St. Paul mayor. But as documented in this powerful Pioneer Press obit, Nick served too. First as a reporter at the Minneapolis Tribune starting in 1973. Bye, Diana. Then in 1986, and as our cameras captured, he was off to a columnist job at the Pioneer Press, only to return for one more six-year stint at the Strib in 2003. In a series of tweets, retired journalist David Brower writes, Nick Coleman was the most exasperating media figure I ever covered. But Brower adds, in the end, Nick Coleman should be remembered as a Minnesota patriot, a critical patriot who also once and ironically appeared on a TV game show. This is uh, Nick Coleman from Minneapolis, Minnesota, critic, TV critic, That's or a right. newspaper yes. back there. This was Nick's 129 seconds of at least TV fame. Can I have a tea, please? Well, not all that good. He wouldn't win at the game, as he humbly later confided. Performed disastrously. But by all accounts, he won within the headlines, helping to raise the community he loved ever higher. Nick Coleman is survived by his wife, his six children, siblings, friends, and fans. The Pioneer Press reports his funeral service will be held at 11 a.m. on Friday at the Church of the Assumption in St. Paul. Back to you. Now, keep in mind that his funeral service has already been held by the time we're airing this piece. Uh, I used to work at the St. Paul Pioneer Press. Uh, I've known Nick Coleman for 20 years. Uh, he and I disagreed on things politically. We didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things when it came to public policy. But Nick and I did agree on a lot of things historically. And he had written us, and we actually went round and round a few rounds about the flag of the 28th Virginia. Now, Nick had just written in 1998 this long series about the first Minnesota at Gettysburg and the capturing of the 28th Virginia flag. And I disagreed with him on where the flag should be. I feel, you know, I felt, feel now as I felt then that the war's been over for now over 150 years that perhaps it's time that the 28th Virginia flag should go back to Virginia. Nick said, no, finders, keepers, losers, weepers. And he and I went round and round over the next few years over this, probably about the next five years. And then one day he came over to me and said, I've had a change of heart. I uh, don't think that we should have the flag in Minnesota any longer. But I don't think it should go back to Virginia either. And I looked at Nick and said, I've had a change of heart too. There's only one place that flag belongs. And at the same time, we both said Gettysburg. Nick and I were actually able to find common ground on things. And he, I have to admit, he always fought for what he believed in. But he was always at least willing to listen to the other side. I still consider Nick Coleman a friend of mine, even though we didn't agree on things. 
and I think that the Twin Cities now do, has suffered a uh, loss in the journalism world. So God bless, Nick. I'm glad I knew you. Anyhow, we're now going to go on over to our Prager University segment, uh, Walt Disney, The American Dreamer. I want to tell you about an American original, a man who saw into the future and made it a reality. Now, he isn't the only one to do this. There were American originals before him, Benjamin Franklin, the Wright brothers, John D. Rockefeller. And there are American originals in our time, like Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Elon Musk. But in the middle of the 20th century, there was no better example than Walt Disney. 50 years after his death, his name still stands atop a global empire. Raised on a small family farm in Missouri, Walt Disney arrived in Hollywood in 1923 with little more than a suitcase and a pencil. But he had something else, an idea. An idea to explore humanity's foibles through cartoon animals. Now, I know it sounds obvious now, but only because we live in a world that he helped create. At first, Disney, like most entrepreneurs, did it <coughs> himself. He wrote, produced, directed, and animated. And animation is a painstakingly time-intensive task. In the early days, it would take hundreds, if not thousands, of separate drawings to create a moving cartoon. But hard work was really never a problem for Walt Disney. Living on baked beans and renting a one-room office for $5 a month, he believed he was onto something, and nobody could convince him otherwise. And Disney would need every bit of that conviction. Now, though the barriers to entry in Hollywood in the 1920s were low, the competition was cutthroat. But a charming rodent and the coming of sound allowed him to break through. Steamboat Willie. In 1928, starring an early version of a whistling Mickey Mouse confirmed Disney's belief that there was an audience, a very large audience, for what he wanted to produce. By 1933, Mickey was the biggest star in the world, and in that year alone, a cartoon mouse received 800,000 pieces of fan mail. Within a decade, Disney had transformed his one-person operation into a major studio employing a thousand animators. But Disney was a restless personality. He was easily dissatisfied with his own success, and he wanted to make a full-length animated feature. It couldn't be good. It had to be great. It couldn't be in black and white. It had to be in color. And it couldn't just be in color. It had to be art in motion. It would be very expensive, far beyond what he had ever spent on a single project. But money didn't really interest him. It was only a means to an end. That end? Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Three years in the making. It was finally released in 1937, and it was an instant and phenomenal success, worth every dime spent, every heartache he had endured. Disney followed it with one artistic triumph after another, Pinocchio, Fantasia, Dumbo, Bambi. But by the late 40s, Disney's creative restlessness kicked in again. This time he had a new vision. He wanted to create a new kind of entertainment experience, not 2D, but a 3D world. He called it a theme park. And typically for Walt, it would be very, very expensive. But where was he going to get the money? Disney had a plan. He would trade his known quantity, his ability to engage an audience, for an unknown quantity, this crazy theme park idea. He approached the three television networks, NBC, CBS, and ABC, with this proposal. He'd create a live-action TV show. In exchange, they would give him the money to build this theme park. Well, CBS turned him down. It was too risky. NBC couldn't make up their own mind. But ABC, the youngest and the least successful of the three networks, desperately needed a hit. They said, yes, please. So with ABC's money, Disney built his park. Disneyland soon became another iconic Disney creation, the fantasy destination of every child on Earth. And that's as true today as it was when it opened 
in 1955. Men like Disney are rare, but far less so in America. Why? Well, because traditionally, Americans, unlike other people in other countries, don't rely on the government to get things done. And ideally, the government stays out of their way. Americans instead rely on their own ingenuity. In America, the only limit to your ambition is your own imagination. And if we want more American originals like Walt Disney, let's hope we keep it that way. I'm Glenn Beck for Prager University. Now, as you watch that, I hope you were keeping in the back of your mind the question, how much government interference impedes the ability of people to achieve their vision? I bring that up because the Minnesota legislative session just ended earlier this week. And we're going to give you a rundown on what happened in the waning days of the, and hours of the session. This happens every year. Session ends, we get a flurry of activity right afterwards. We get a showdown between the governor and the legislature. This has gone on for eight years. And I really hope that the people can expect, start to demand and expect more out of the politicians. We're going to take a look right now at Minnesota lawmakers wrapping up the session with a flurry of bills. Keep in mind the American dream. And when you see what happens here, ask yourself, if you were a dreamer, is this going to help or hurt you? Let's take a look at this video from Channel 4. Legislators have wrapped up their work for the year at the state capitol. There could be more political bickering on the way in the coming days, though. Mary McGuire is live in St. Paul with more on the end of the session and what comes next, Mary. Good morning, Jason. Lawmakers wrapped up here at the state capitol just before midnight, I think 1148 p.m. it was, but more drama could be on the way. The governor has criticized a lack of compromise between lawmakers and has threatened to veto two important bills. Now, last night, Governor Mark Dayton warned he may give the red stamp to federal tax compliance and government spending bills, two major centerpieces of the 2018 session. The DFL governor and Republican leaders have sparred over the details included in those two packages. Last week, Dayton vetoed the tax bill because it didn't include emergency school funding. The final spending bill sent to his desk includes money to fight opioid addiction and abuse, to increase senior care facility oversight, and to improve school safety. After things were said and done here, both sides had very different takes on how negotiations went this year. You know, we feel great, and when we look at not only what we accomplished this session, but what we accomplished in the last session, we put uh, an un unprecedented amount of money into road and bridge infrastructure. We, we passed an unprecedented amount of tax relief. Um, we, we tackled big, difficult issues like opioids and elder abuse. Um, we're going to have a lot of great things to talk about on the campaign trail, um, and I'm confident that Minnesotans will uh, place their confidence in us again uh, this November, so we feel good about the election. Total mismanagement. This legislative session ended in complete chaos and in shambles when you look at the work product that will come out of it. Now on Saturday, the governor also knocked down a law that would have toughened up penalties for protesters blocking freeways or transit lines here in Minnesota. And we may not know the fate of every single one of those bills for a while. The governor has two weeks to either sign or veto them, Jason. Mary, what's going to happen today at the Capitol? Well, really, it's a waiting game to see what the governor will do with those bills. The governor promised that there would not be a special session here in St. Paul, and that appears to have been a promise that was kept. All right, Mary McGuire, thank you. Our Pat Kessler has been covering this session all year. He was there all day, all night yesterday, well past midnight. You might call this a tale of two sessions. 2018 was really unusual. They were here since February. But it came down to the last two hours of the legislative session. Republicans, after adjournment, said they had a lot of accomplishments and they're proud of it. They said this might be one of the best sessions they've ever had. Democrats, though, are coming out and saying this is not only one of the least productive sessions ever, they're going to take it to the campaign trail. One of the big issues here is going to be the tax bill and the spending bill. Governor Dayton using very harsh language, saying right now he is going to veto both of these two biggest bills of the year. And on top of all of that, 
he called Republicans and their actions disgusting, appalling, and even vile. So now that the session is over, the governor has two weeks to decide whether to sign or veto all of these bills, and that's what the drama is going to be coming up. All right, Pat, stay with WCCO. We'll have continuing coverage. So, of course, the governor has to go out and throw out insults, have a little temper tantrum, instead of actually doing the gubernatorial responsibility of negotiating. But this has been the way Mark Dayton has operated for the past eight years. Should we actually expect anything different? You know, I've been involved in Minnesota politics for over 30 years now. I have spent many a long night at the legislative uh, gallery watching the last night of session. Now, thankfully, I can just watch the last night of session at home on television. I don't actually have to be there watching it live in person. And every session, every year, comes down to the last two hours of the legislative session. And then the work actually begins in getting peaceful resolution. Should anybody be surprised that this is the way the process goes? Should anybody be surprised that everything gets packaged into these large omnibus bills that are passed within the last two hours of the legislative session? What happened in 1989 and 1990 is no different than what's happening today. This is the way the process is. Yet, for some stupid reason, there's so many people in 2018 who think that omnibus bills and trickery on the last day of session is like a new thing. No, it's happened for over 30 years. It's probably longer than that. That's only my history. I remember being in the uh, House gallery when they would shut the clocks off at 11.59 p.m. Per the state constitution, you're not allowed to convene a session past the midnight on a certain day. So they just stopped the clocks at 11.59 and continued negotiating and, and, and doing their legislative business until 3 or 4 o'clock the next morning. I think one year it was like 6 a.m. when they finally adjourned. I remember when uh, the late state senator, Senate President Jim Metzen, ended up getting a DUI coming back from the last night of session. Session didn't adjourn until like 2 o'clock in the morning, and of course he had a few drinks afterwards and got pulled over on the way home. And it's because that is the norm of what happens. Not, not getting pulled over for DUI, but finishing the session this way, it's normal. Yet it ceases to amaze me how many people think that what we're seeing is actually abnormal. This is the process, folks. So now let's take a look at the many questions that the session ends with. Lawmakers wrap up the 2018 session, both the Minnesota House and Senate, adjourned right before midnight last night. On that motion, all in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. We are adjourned. There were plenty of last minute votes as we're used to seeing, but this morning there are still many question marks. Republicans control both chambers of the legislature this session. Of course, they said they're proud of how things went. But Governor Mark Dayton, a Democrat, sure did not hold back in his criticism of the session. He's threatened to veto the major tax and spending packages. Well, we feel great, and when we look at not only what we accomplished this session, but what we accomplished in the last session, we put uh, an un unprecedented amount of money into road and bridge infrastructure. We, we passed an unprecedented amount of tax relief. Um, we, we tackled big, difficult issues like opioids and elder abuse. Um, we're going to have a lot of great things to talk about on the campaign trail, um, and I'm confident that Minnesotans will uh, place their confidence in us again uh, this November. So we feel good about the election. This is different from anything I've experienced before. We're solely focused on what benefits them for their re-election. has nothing to do with trying to work cooperatively with me. It has nothing to do with the best interests of Minnesota. It's all about themselves, their own re-election, and it is disgusting. WCCO chief political reporter Pat Kessler joins Whoa. us now. And Pat, what? you worked very hard over the weekend. Very different stance between the governor and Speaker Dowd on this session. How do you rate your work this weekend, Pat? 
Well, it's not as good as yours as always. That's right. But uh, <laughs> but we were. It was like a lunar eclipse because I think we were at work at the same time this morning, like three o'clock in the morning. Right. There was a little crossover. Yeah. yeah. So one of those. But yeah, this was really interesting. Two different views of the session. Uh, in which uh, the Republicans uh, put out a list, a nice list here, and they checked off everything uh, that they said that they did. And there really was a lot that they have sent to the governor. The governor has a completely different view of all of this, and we don't know if he's going to sign these bills or veto them. We talked with Melissa Hortman. She's the Democratic minority leader in the House last night, and she said the work is not done. I mean, the legislature can go ahead and pass these bills, but what makes a successful session is if the governor actually signs them into law. And that's what's in question this morning. The, the challenge here, Pat, I think, is on that list that you held up on one side, it had all of the things that the governor said he wanted and were his priorities. And the Republicans are saying, I don't know, he said he wanted emergency school funding. We've given some funding. I guess when, when this goes to the campaign trail, who do you think ends up on the right side of this? Yeah, it's really muddied and it's muddled uh, coming out of the legislative session. So, yes, for example, uh, they wanted uh, school funding, but the governor wanted that in a separate bill. They put it in this huge spending bill so that uh, the, the, the governor cannot veto the bill. Uh, opioid crisis response, that's a whole other one. They put that in a big spending bill, but the governor wanted something completely different, separate, so that he wouldn't have to lump all of these into one bill. There's so many things that, uh, that, are, that are in that one bill, and the governor has said he is going to veto it despite all of the good things that he might like in it, uh, he says that it's a terrible way hmm. to legislate. Yeah. And Pat, Dayton called Republicans and their actions disgusting, appalling, and even vile. Yikes. Have yep. we heard him use language like this before at the Capitol? Yeah, this got stronger and stronger as the session went on. Here is the, the, uh, the disconnect that I feel and that, that I see here at the Capitol. They stand up in press conferences, the governor and the Republican leaders, and they say, hey, we get along. We had very nice sessions. And then they just hammer at each other. They go at it. Uh, the governor ramped up his rhetoric quite a bit last night. That was about as strong as I've ever heard, talking about what he says the Republicans are doing, just going after what he says are special interests, trying to get him to veto bills that they can take to the campaign trail. In the governor's view, the Republicans were just pushing straight ahead for the election, and that's why he was using some of those words. Republicans said they believe they've done everything. They passed the tax conformity bill, tax cuts for everybody. So this is going to be something to watch how you explain it on each side. Governor not running again might be one of the reasons he used yeah, that language. Sure. As voters, you're left once again feeling like, exactly. what are all of these people doing? Yeah. No yeah. kidding. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Pat. We'll see you at 5 you and 6 today. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. Governor Dayton did not really come out and talk about the, uh, the uh, emergency spending for the schools until the last couple of weeks of the legislative session. Where was he when the session began? No, the last couple of weeks. I want this, and I want it in a separate bill. Actually, he didn't want it in a separate bill at first. He wanted it in the omnibus. I mean, he, he's, Governor Dayton has flip-flopped on this so many times, I can't even keep it straight. I think he started off with a separate bill, then he wanted it in the omnibus, they put it in the omnibus, then he wants it in a separate bill. The fact is, Mark Dayton wanted an excuse to veto the legislation. Mark Dayton wanted it his way or the highway. That's the way Mark Dayton always is. This whole thing about Mark Dayton using vile language is the strongest I've ever heard him. Come on, folks. We've had eight years of this governor. All he has to do is go back and reread the script from the previous year and the year before that and the year before that because Mark Dayton uses the same script. What he's getting agitated about is the fact that the Republican legislature realizes that he plays from the same script, and so they're rewriting the script on him. And he's frustrated in the fact that, you know, they're calling his bluff. But it was only a year ago when Mark Dayton did a line-item veto and vetoed the legislative funding. Mark Dayton vetoed legislate, the, the funding to keep the legislature in operation and forced a, a state Supreme Court showdown over that. That's our governor at work. Mark Dayton with the veto pen. 
Next clip, please. Uh, he's got two weeks to decide on spend, tax and spending bills. Now, we know he didn't take that much time, but let's take a look, a look at the clip. Legislative session came to an end overnight in St. Paul. Governor Mark Dayton had some choice words for lawmakers on what he perceives as a lack of compromise this year. It really is appalling. It's just so vile. It is disgusting. When the House stands adjourned, sine die. Last night, Governor Dayton warned he may give the red veto stamp to the federal tax compliance and government spending bills two major centerpieces of the 2018 session. Mary McGuire joins us now live from the state capitol with more on what happens now. Mary. Well, Kim, some big questions still remain over the fate of those key pieces of legislation. The governor has two weeks to decide whether he will sign or veto those bills, potentially impacting thousands of Minnesotans. Legislators have been working to pass new laws since February, but it all came down to the final hours of the session last night. When the House stands adjourned, sine die. A compromise tax conformity and education funding bill, a bonding bill, a pension bill, and a supplemental budget bill all passed on Sunday, according to Republicans. The governor doesn't like the tax bill because he says it favors the wealthy and doesn't give enough to schools in need. He's threatened to use his veto stamp, using some harsh language to describe the negotiations this year. I've never seen a session this badly mismanaged. I've never seen a session this less transparent. I've never seen a session more beholden to the special interests. If he does veto it, taxes could rise for hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans because our state tax code won't align with the federal one. Now, as for that supplemental spending measure, Republican leadership warns of the consequences a veto would have across the state. There's money for opi opioids in the bill, which the governor has identified as a priority. There's some language on elder care and some good reforms in elder care. There's money for mental health for both the kids and for farmers. I certainly hope that he will sign them because those bills Bills, they're really good bills. We don't know exactly what the governor will do just yet, so as lawmakers make their way back home for the year, Veto Watch starts up. Now, like I mentioned before, the governor is under a two-week deadline to make his decision about those bills. He has promised there will not be a special session this year like there was last year, and for now, that appears to be the case, Kim. All right, Mary McGuire reporting live in St. Paul. Thank you. And so instead of just continuing on the vein of the uh, veto watch, no, he actually did veto the legislation. I mean, there were, were a couple of days delay here from the time the session began and our taping day. So what we're going to do now is just skip right ahead to uh, Mark Dayton on the veto. One hour ago, Minnesota Governor Mark Dayton said he is vetoing the tax conformity and budget bills. Those were the two big bills passed right before the session ended on Sunday night. No special session. They had their chance. They, they messed this session up worse than any I've ever seen. In the last week, 10 days, as you know, it was just absolute chaos. They couldn't agree among themselves. We couldn't get a straight answer because the House and the Senate couldn't speak, couldn't, couldn't agree, and they couldn't, sometimes weren't even speaking to one another. And we got um, measures at the very last minute with uh, no, for, no, no uh, disclosure ahead of time. We talked a couple of months ago how it's going to be a, just a transparent process. It was the most uh, secretive behind closed doors where the committee chairs would get together, I guess, with the leadership, and they'd decide, and they'd go out and tell the Commerce Committee what they, what they decided. Even the, even the Commerce Committees were, were a sham. It was a worst manage legislative session I've ever seen. The governor said the tax conformity bill did too little for ordinary people. The bill was needed to get the state code in alignment with federal changes. The massive budget bill was filled with spending important to many people, including funding aimed at making schools safer. Pat Kessler will have much more on what the governor said on our evening newscast. Still waiting. So here's the thing. Governor Dayton thinks that this is a really horrendous legislative session. Here's the reason why, folks. The Republicans handle the legislative sessions just like the Democrats usually do when they're in the majority. That's all it is. And when the Republicans campaigned on tax cuts, tax conformity, they actually delivered. Governor Dayton 
didn't get a Democratic uh, a legislative agenda. Governor Dayton would, was not, the Republicans were not giving in. And that's the nature of compromise as far as Governor Dayton's concerned. They didn't compromise. They didn't give in to Governor Dayton's demands, especially the last-minute demands. They pretty much ignored most of what he had to say. And they went out and did what they were going to do. And veto be damned. So he vetoed. Um, here's the thing. Now, Minnesota taxpayers, Republican, Democrat, Green Party, Independence Party, uh, Libertarian Party, doesn't matter. You are getting hosed. You are getting hosed because the, the state of Minnesota tax code has to be in compliance with the federal tax code. And that's what the tax conformity did. Governor Dayton now made it more difficult for you to file your taxes until this is fixed. Now you have to do two forms. Now you probably even have to pay more. That's what Governor Dayton delivered for you. He delivered you a tax increase. He delivered you additional paperwork, additional regulatory requirements. You can thank your governor for that. So now, back to the pundits, now that Dayton vetoed the bill, what's next? Let's take a look. To learn the full impact of Governor Mark Dayton's vetoes, he made good on his threat. He killed the two biggest pieces of legislation from the 2018 session. Now, Dayton says the tax bill did not do enough for middle class taxpayers. He also criticized a major spending package as being stuffed with bad policy, he said. Republican House Speaker Kurt Dowd says the governor is a failure. I'm just incredibly disappointed. Uh, I'm, I'm actually to the point where I'm embarrassed for the governor that he did this. This failure is their responsibility. Failure of this session, failure of these two major bills. The budget bill would have funded schools in budget crunches and also helped them pay for security improvements. Governor Dayton has vowed he will not call a special session. So WCCO chief political reporter Pat Kessler joins us now. Wow. So he we're embarrassed for you, Pat. Yeah. We're disappointed. I know you are. You. Yeah. Birds fly, fish swim. That's mm. the headline. Yeah. So he says he will not call a special session now, yeah. but maybe after the election. Well, that is something that if there's a lame duck uh, session of the legislature, that might be something. Mm -hmm. uh, but we watched yesterday uh, the snotty grams going back and yeah. forth between these people. Uh, it uh, was extreme dysfunction at the Minnesota Capitol. This 2018 session is generally a failure. Now, Republicans say the session isn't a failure. Governor Dayton is a failure. So I think outside the building, people are looking at this and saying, what is going on? Uh, mm -hmm. Why aren't we getting anything done? I think that's the takeaway from this 2018 session, the two biggest bills of the year vetoed. Mm -hmm. And there's no chances so far of anything happening from here. And everyone's pointing the blame yeah, that absolutely. way. Well, the absolutely. governor's not running. Well, and uh, so now the governor is not running for re-election, and this is kind of where we stand in a sinkhole. We're uh, sitting here with a blame game. That's politics. That's what happens every year. Now we're going to get ready for the next election cycle. But we're going to, before we actually, we're going to talk about the election here coming up. Uh, but before we do that, we are going to take a look at the chairman of the state senate tax committee. Because he had some important things to say about the tax bill which he drafted. The governor this morning made a big production of vetoing your tax bill. What do you think about that? Well, I've got a lot of thoughts about that. But uh, it's, uh, in short, it's, sh it's shameless. It's, uh, it would, if it wasn't so, if the consequences weren't so serious, it'd be laughable. Uh, so um, he uh, enjoys putting on political stunts. And if he spends half as much time uh, and effort into improving the school systems in this state and helping out the educators and the families, as he does in political stunts, we wouldn't be in this spot. Which begs the question, by the way, is that he's been in charge for eight years with his commissioner, and all of a sudden we have an emergency and a crisis for $140 million in our schools. He's been in charge for eight years with his commissioner. So it begs that question. The other thing is, if he was really concerned about the kids and the students and the K-12 and the outcomes of this state, he'd let parents... Uh, uh, give parents more ability to choose the schools where their kids go to so they don't have to suffer in failing schools in Minneapolis-St. Paul. And they could uh, uh, find a better path for themselves. So 
if he was really concerned about it, I think he'd take a different approach. So this is a lot of political stunts. Uh, it's, it's a waste of time. He's not serious about helping people or the kids. And lastly, I think it's a distraction. He's trying to distract from the latest um, uh, scandal that hit his administration, a serious one, hundreds of millions of dollars going overseas for a daycare fraud, but we'll get into that in a minute. So not very happy. He's a, he's a good jokester. Well, you brought up the, uh, the latest scandal on his watch, the, the massive rampant fraud in, uh, in childcare assistance. What do, you, what do you think about it? Well, I think Minnesotans and all of us up here are rightfully uh, outraged. Uh, not only is it happening, but it has been happening for years. There's apparently some investigations going on, but um, uh, and we're happy for that. But in the meantime, they have known that hundreds of millions of dollars have been going out of this country into possibly uh, over overseas and possibly funding terrorism. Now, we don't know that for sure, but it's been going out of the country. So there's a, a couple things that happened up here. Legislatively here, we brought attention to it. There were committee, committee hearings on it, and the gentleman who uh, was the whistleblower had a lot of um, shocking information for uh, the public to hear. Secondly, uh, a bill has been presented that would create a separate agency, a, a quasi-independent agency to investigate fraud in the, at the city of Minnesota, and especially for daycare. Thirdly, I contacted um, uh, Congressman Emmer and talked to some other folks about what they're doing. So the congressman is following up uh, with Homeland Security, DHS, and starting to send out letters and make phone calls to find out what they can do, to find out what they can find out at the federal level. I believe we need more independence on this. I believe we need uh, more coordination, the county attorneys, U.S. attorneys, to investigate the, the fraud, but also the possible uh, 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 violation of federal law and funding terrorism overseas. So uh, many aspects to this. So I hope the county attorney is working on it. The U.S. attorney, I'm sure, is uh, familiar with it and hopefully is already engaged. We're going to follow up with the congressman and other folks to make sure that's happening too. So state-level stuff, federal-level stuff, uh, active approach to addressing the problem. All right, and final question I want to ask you is, uh, yesterday the Demo Senate Democrats killed a infrastructure-heavy bonding bill. What do, you, uh, what do you think about that? What do you think the prospects are for the rest of the session? Well, it has been a bu busy week, so a couple things. I'm going to tie that into the tax bill, right? So yesterday, our tax bill that we put on the floor, a conference committee report, was a compromise with the governor. The governor wouldn't even come to the table to talk about gold bullying and <coughs> simple policy issues, right? He didn't want to do that, so they were playing coy again, more political stunts. So we moved his way. There were a lot of things in the bill that he, we agreed with, right, with the governor initially. And then we moved his direction. We gave on a lot of issues, including increase, giving him some tax increases on businesses. So we even did that. Not all of it, but some of it. So we got rid of a lot of things he didn't like. We put some things in there that he did like in the hopes that he would listen. But before we even got to the floor, he said he was going to be to it in a grand stump because he can't get something else done. So it, when, when the Democrats, all the Democrats voted against the bill, all of them, they voted against veterans, they voted against uh, disaster relief, they voted against public safety, they voted against uh, small businesses and farmers getting relief from us being caught up in, uh, in the snare of uh, complicated estate tax and trust tax definitions. He voted against, they voted against, and he vetoed a bill that helps middle class Minnesotans. The cop and a teacher, right? A married couple, like one might be a police officer, one's a teacher or a nurse or a plumber, pick one. They can make 140, 150,000. But to him, those are special interests, people. Those are special interests to him. 2.6 million people in our bill would have been held harmless. 2.1 million would have gotten tax relief. That's 82% would have gotten, would have received some money back. And 99.8% uh, would have seen uh, held harmless or received some money back. So 70% of those folks, uh, over a million, would have received our under 80,000 of income. So. Uh, if those are special interest folks of the governor, well, I guess, as I said in the, in the paper, and the quote was that I don't think, I didn't think he needs to get out more. He needs to get out and visit with folks, real people out there who are working and doing things because he is completely delusional. Yes, I said the word for public consumption, delusional. This is frustrating. It is annoying. It is aggravating. And people and I are frankly tired of it. So they voted against a lot of good stuff in the bill, good policy, compromise, went his direction, but they are playing political games and uh, playing with people's lives and, and livelihoods. Frankly, they are playing with people's lives and livelihoods because uh, if he doesn't get this done, then school safety goes out, opioids issues, um, uh, 
roads and bridges. So let me go to that piece. Now I'm rambling a bit, but let me go to the roads and bridges piece. So that was the tax bill. Then they vote. Then the Democrats vote against the, the bonding bill. They vote against the very things they wanted. Roads and bridges and critical infrastructure. More than half the bill was roads and bridges and critical infrastructure, right? Mental health facilities. Senator Weger voted against the, uh, against the uh, bike trail he wanted. He voted against the bike trail. He lobbied against all session for it. Then he voted against it. So, one, so the final thing here is that they're obstructions. The, they, their greed does not end. And the limit of their obstruction for political gain is endless. They will do anything for political power. There's an old, uh, I actually feel sorry for the governor in a way, and his buddies, they sit around, they must be miserable people. They sit around a table in a room, miserable and unhappy. So they got to make other people miserable and unhappy for their gain. And I think there is a problem here, right? I think the Democrats truly believe they're, they're in jeopardy of losing a lot. So here's the deal. First, if, we support, if they support a Trump sort of tax relief bill, well, that's not a win for them. If, but they also know, some of them know, that we're in a budget crisis in the next couple of years, driven by demographics, retiring baby boomers, and the shrinking labor force, and fewer people having babies. They know we're in a crisis. They know we are having trouble. So they're in a bind. So they're in a pickle. And you almost feel sorry for them. They're in a tough spot because they don't want to vote for tax relief because they know tax relief is successful and works. But a vote for tax relief to solve their budget problems and to get economic growth means they lose and their religion is shown to be a fraud. Their religion, their religion, a big government controlling our lives, taxing us to death, and, and just corruption and obstruction and greed. That false religion will be exposed. So they're in a tough spot. So good luck to them. I wish they weren't so miserable, but I am not interested in giving them any more money for schools, uh, it's a fraud, it's phony, it's fake. Uh, it's just a, it's a distraction from all these other issues. So they're in a tough spot. They can't possibly vote for a tax bill. And I thought about this a while back, because it's a, it's a win for us, a lose, loss for them. And it kind of undermines their whole philosophy of big government is the best way to go. And then they lose control of all the money that, uh, they want to have the money so they can control everything you do. So. I guess that's my rant that covers a busy week, the frustrations of uh, my colleagues and myself and a lot of citizens in this state that, uh, you know, whether it's the tax bill or the bonding bill or the, uh, or the uh, corruption and fraud uh, now result in, in, uh, in the uh, daycare problem. So people are tired of it. I'm tired of it. Um, and it's time we give the citizens a little more respect. Uh, the old forgotten citizen thing, right? They need more respect, you know, citizen A has a problem, they go to the politician B, and then they just solve the problem, and who pays for it? Citizen C, you, me, and the 2.6 uh, million Minnesotans that he thinks are special interests. So, and the Democrats thinks are, uh, think are special interests. So, um, we need to remember them, and they, we, they need a little more respect. And, um, and uh, perhaps time has come that uh, the, uh, the Democrats and the governor are going to learn that in the, the right way. And I hope my colleagues uh, join me in doing so. So, And so that was State Senator Roger Chamberlain, a uh, Republican from Lionel Lakes, talking about numerous things. That, of course, was taken before the end of the legislation, uh, uh, legislative session. That certainly was before the uh, Governor Dayton veto of the tax bill and other uh, and the um, other legislation. So Senator Chamberlain has issued a follow-on statement since the veto uh, had taken place uh, yesterday. Uh, and, he, and he said, quote, The governor behaved like a toddler, emotional, impulsive, and unreasonable, vetoing everything and bringing the session to a crashing halt because he couldn't get exactly what he wanted is just another temper tantrum. It has become a recurring theme with his governor. It is a legacy of chaos and failure. The truly sad thing is the governor's selfishness will have a devastating impact on Minnesotans. His vetoes tell us he doesn't care about protecting students from the next school shooting, that he doesn't care about saving the next victims of opioid abuse, 
that he doesn't care about people struggling with mental health emergencies, that he doesn't care about victims of elder abuse. The list goes on and on and on. These people don't care about the governor's political games. They just want to live their lives, and the governor turned his back on them today. That was State Senator Roger Chamberlain, Republican from Lionel Lakes. Well, now that the legislative session is over with, and the governor has stated that he does not want a special session, I don't think the legislature wants a special session either, nothing is going to happen until next January after we have an election and after the new governor is inaugurated and the new legislators are you know, taking their seats. So that's it for, what, six months. We've got six months, no changes, no more bonding, no tax conformity, status quo. That's what we've got. We've got six more months of the status quo, and then we'll see what the next legislature and the next governor have to do to actually start working for the people of Minnesota again. And you get to do two taxes next year. Uh, we are now going to start looking at the uh, 2018 election cycle. And we actually had one of the candidates for office in our studio today. I had a chance to uh, have a short interview with State Representative Jim Newberger, who is now leaving the legislature and he is running against U.S. Senator Amy Klobuchar for her seat. So here is a discussion that I had with State Representative Jim Newberger. All right, well today we are actually visiting with State Representative Jim Newberger who is running for the United States Senate against Amy Klobuchar. Jim, thank you and welcome to North Star Oasis. Well, thank you, Mr. Williams. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, uh, a fellow St. Cloud State alumni, tell, me, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I grew up in uh, St. Louis Park and uh, I went to Moorhead State, transferred to St. Cloud State and graduated with a degree in mass communications and political science. Uh, I then went on to become a paramedic. I uh, worked as a paramedic for uh, 30 years for a level one trauma center uh, in Minneapolis. Uh, I've been serving in the Minnesota House for three terms, and I'm resigning uh, from my term at self-imposed uh, term limit so that we can take the fight to Senator Klobuchar because we really need change in Washington. Now, on, on your final night in session, you gave a really profound speech. You started off talking about an incident. Yes. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit yes. about that? Yes. Um, <clears throat> it's funny. People always ask, they say, well, Jim, how did you get into politics? And I've always been interested. My degree is political science. But sometimes it takes a catalyst, it takes a push to get you uh, into politics. Uh, mine was more of a, a fall than a push. I was, I was working as a paramedic. Uh, there was a crash in our service area. It was a very cold winter day. Uh, one of those days that, where the wind was blowing diagonal at about 30 miles an hour, very icy, really slippery. Um, and we got to this crash, and it was a van, and there was a man trapped under the van, and he was okay. Well, we couldn't get him out, and we had to be very careful because it was so slippery. So we decided that we were going to call a big fire engine to come and park next to the van, and then we were going to attach chains to the van and then chains to the fire engine so that if, if the van slid, the man would be okay. Uh, so as we were waiting for the fire truck, I told my partner, I said, well, I'm going to um, get in the ambulance. I'm going to pull it around to the front of the crash to block the wind because it was really brutal that day. And my partner said, okay. So I got in the truck, uh, my ambulance, I pulled around to the front of the crash, real good wind block. Uh, I got out of the ambulance, and as soon as I came around the front of the ambulance, I hit a really slick spot uh, on the road. And my feet went out in front of me, uh, my hands went back, and I, I, hit, the, I hit the pavement really hard. Um, I, I was knocked out for a short period of time. I hit the back of my head, but I also shattered my left wrist. Um, I, to this day, I have a plate and 13 screws that hold it all together. Um, it was during the recovery time. Uh, I, had, I had four months where I was doing nothing. I was getting better, and um, I, was a, I was a little bored, and my phone rang, and a local uh, a Republican conservative activist called me and said, Jim, uh, would you please get involved in the local Republican Party? And I was interested, but I asked her, I said, well, what's this going to cost me or what's this going to take? And she said, I promise you, one hour a month, that's it. That's all it'll take. Um, 
And three terms later? And three terms later, here we are. Now we're running for the U.S. Senate. So uh, if anyone ever tells you it's only an hour a month, uh, no, it's not. But is it worth it? Absolutely. Uh, every hour we've put in has been an absolute uh, worthwhile investment. Uh, the conservative cause in Minnesota has to move forward, so it's time well invested. You're just completing your third term. Mm -hmm. What is your greatest accomplishment at the State House? Oh, I would have to say um, the, uh, the, there would be a three way tie. Uh, first of all, the Obama power plan, what they called the Clean Power Plan, uh, was put into action by Governor Dayton, uh, and they worked really hard to shut down our power plant, the Sherco uh, 1, 2, and 3 power plants in my hometown. It's the largest power plant in the Midwest, and it burns coal. Uh, we fought for a couple of years, and we were not successful because the Democrats had the total majority. Um, but we didn't give up. And we were able to at least fight to, to get two of the three units replaced with a big natural gas plant. By doing that, we saved the tax base and we saved hundreds of jobs. Um, getting Mark Dayton to sign that bill was a miracle, and it was work well spent. Um, it was time well spent. Uh, that was a huge accomplishment for us. Uh, I would also have to say um, the work that we've done with post-traumatic stress for uh, EMS responders, for first responders, uh, working in EMS for 30 years, I can tell you it's an issue that uh, it, its time has come. We need to help these folks. I know because I personally have experienced PTSD over the 30 years I've worked as a paramedic. Um, and I would have to say though, uh, as far as policy wise, um, my biggest accomplishment would be the emergency powers bill. Um, this was a, probably the most significant Second Amendment, pro-Second Amendment bill that's been passed since permit to carry. Um, right after Hurricane Katrina, uh, what was happening is that government units in the military, they were going around, they were ordered uh, by the government to go house to house, door to door, and confiscate people's firearms. They'd knock on the door, they'd say, do you have a firearm? If the answer was yes, they would take it from you. Uh, legally and lawfully owned firearm. These people were breaking no laws of any kind. Um, that's unconstitutional. These folks just wanted to stay in their homes and they needed some way to protect themselves and their families and basically this was being taken from them. Right after Hurricane Katrina was finished, um, the state of Louisiana was the first state to pass this bill, to pass this law to say you can't do that. Mm -hmm. if, no matter what the situation is during a declared state of emergency, just because you want to confiscate our firearms doesn't mean you can. So they passed a law saying you can't do that. About 20 other states followed suit, and Minnesota is always slow on these things. Mm -hmm. uh, they tried it about uh, five years ago, um, and it failed. Governor Dayton wouldn't sign it. It didn't go through the committee process very well. It failed. Um, some of the um, pro-Second Amendment folks approached me and said, Jim, we really need someone that's going to fight for this. Will you please fight for this issue? We really would like to see this pass. I said, I'd be happy to carry the bill. Uh, we went through four uh, committee hearings, uh, some big House floor fight uh, battles on that. Uh, we got it to the governor's desk, and by golly, we got him to sign it. So now, during declared states of emergency, regardless of what kind they are, they cannot just simply confiscate your firearms just because they decide they want to do that. Um, if you are not breaking the law, they can't take your firearms. If you're already breaking the law, that's a different story. If they can already arrest you, you know, for, for looting or a felony or whatever, that's a different story. But if you're just in your home and you have your firearms, they can't take them away. That was my bill, and I'm very proud of that. Um, and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll never have to see that come to fruition. But in case it does, you're protected. So what led to the decision to run against Amy Klobuchar for U.S. Senate? A uh, simple decision. She needs to go. She really does. Um, and everybody, I've worked on the last two campaigns that ran against her. I helped with the, the Kennedy campaign. I was a volunteer in our area. And then I was also on the inside circle uh, for the Severson campaign, although he did lose the endorsement to Kurt Bills. But I worked for Kurt Bills, and we transferred all of that campaign knowledge to help Kurt. And I watched um, the mistakes that were made. And these guys are great guys. They worked really hard. Uh, and they would have made great senators. But I'm the only one that's been in all of these battles. I know what it takes to beat Senator Klobuchar. She needs to go. And as a paramedic, uh, it's been ingrained in me. There's no such thing as a no-win situation. I can't walk into a situation and say, oh, well, I'm not going to do this job. This is a job that needs to be done. I'm going to get it done. And I guess lastly, any uh, contact information, if anybody wants to get involved with your campaign? Oh, I'd love to. Um, my website is just Jim for us senate That's F-O-R. 
jim4ussenate.com. All right, Jim Newberger, thank, thank you for you stopping so by. Much. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Well, thank you so much to uh, State Senator, our State Representative Jim Newberger for joining us here at North Star Oasis today. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see exactly what plays out when it comes to the uh, upcoming political campaigns. I know we've got U.S. Senate races, both seats. We've got uh, the State House of Representatives, uh, governor, uh, constitutional officers, so that'll be uh, state auditor, secretary of state, uh, attorney general, um, I'm probably missing one. Uh, oh, yeah, sec secretary of state, uh, attorney general, auditor, yeah, whatever. We, we, we've got them all on the ballot. Um, we're going to have more judicial elections. It's going to be one of those major years when it comes to having a lot of uh, a lot of politics. So now that we're, today is an 87 degree day as we head into the Memorial Day weekend. Summer is about here. The weather is actually cooperating. So now let the parades begin. Let the literature go door to door. We're going to start getting into campaign mode. But we're going to leave you today with our music section. And this is actually what I uh, woke up to today. Uh, somebody uh, in the house that I live in decided they were going to play polka music today. Scratching my head. So we're going to finish with a polka. We're going to finish with In Heaven There Is No Beer. Here we go. <laughs> Uh, this is kind of a religious song, but it's in your blood if you're from the Cleveland area. It's kind of a hymn, um, but I hope you enjoy it. Now that the legislative session is over with, uh, you can go ahead and enjoy some copious amounts of beer if you so choose. With 214 shopping days left until Christmas, I'm Jeff Williams, host for Dallas Pearson, the producer. Thanks for watching North Star Oasis. We will see you next week.